Welcome to our webinar, Poor Substrate Conditions, Environmental Conditions, and Best Practices. If you have any questions during today's presentation, please type them into the question and answer bar on the side of your screen. Today's presentation is by Logan Rivas. Logan is the Manager of Technical Services at MAPE. He is responsible for product support, architectural support, and the regional field representatives. He grew up in the floor covering business and shortly after completing his BBNA from the University of Texas at Arlington, began his own career in the industry. He brings more than 16 years of experience in floor covering and after spending time on the distribution and flooring contractor side of the business, he's joined us here at MAPE, and we're very excited to have his expertise today. Logan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jen. I'm really happy to be here today. I appreciate your time. I hope everybody is, is safe and well and uh, being kind to one another. Um, but again, we, uh, um, and we also hope you're, you're staying busy um, as best you can during these times and finding business and uh, doing well. Um, so today's presentation, as mentioned, uh, we're gonna talk about some of the challenges uh, and just things that are faced daily in the tile industry. Um, you know, this, uh, the tile industry has, has seen, like, like, most, uh, like most industries has seen dramatic changes over the last uh, 20, 30 years because of, uh, um, because of changes in technology, um, leaps that have been made and new products. Um, certainly the sizes of tile has, have changed. Um, and then the, the applications, um, are, are changing with it and so uh, you know the the idea of surface preparation um, and really having to take a hard look at, at their substrate has changed so much over the years because what was once uh, the, the real question was well can I stick to it I mean that's the biggest question I've got here um, you know there is, is much more complicated now and there's a lot more factors to to consider um, you know, and specifically, we'll talk a lot about uh, flatness and, um, you know, and what the industry has to say about that, the standards, uh, where that can sometimes put us into uh, a disagreement and conflict with uh, other trades and uh, with general contractors and uh, ownership and, and so and how to hopefully resolve that and, you know, what's available to you um, on, the, on, the, uh, on the contractor side to help that the industry has provided. And uh, we'll talk about some of the MAPE products that can help you um, achieve what needs to be achieved so that you can have a successful installation. Um, so uh, we'll also talk about the environmental conditions, um, the, the on-site conditions that tile installers are often faced with, and this goes back to the history of tile, that it's such a versatile medium for uh, finishing that, that you know, it, there seems to be this assumption that it really doesn't matter what type of conditions are present, you know, it's tile, right? It goes in pools and fountains, interior, exterior, so what's the big deal? So just uh, get out there and, uh, you know, get it installed. So we'll talk about that, some of the challenges we face there, um, and, you know, some of the ways to, uh, to kind of push through that. So we'll kind of get going now. Um, so when we talk about substrate flatness, what what's the big deal like what are we looking for why what why now why are we having to worry about this now when maybe it never was that big of a deal and um you know i, I think the the very simple starting point is that tiles are getting bigger so you've got one of two things happening with tile these days it seems like they're either really really small or they're getting really really big and um as these tiles get bigger the the um, the imperfections and the inconsistencies in the substrate become a much bigger issue. So, you know, what was once considered a, a large format tile, um, you know, you was an eight by eight and a, uh, you know, a 12 by 12 was getting, was getting really big and, and hard to handle. And so, um, you know, in those days, if you had a substrate that was moving up and down as far as the height, you know, you had high spots, low spots, generally speaking, you could, uh, work your way down into a low spot and then back up into a high spot and still keep all your tiles lined up, um, all your edges and reduce lippage and, um, you know, and, and, and you're, and you were fine. Um, and that's just not the case anymore. So now you're, you're bridging um, these low spots and uh, you're having tiles 
<clears throat> that have joints that meet over these low spots and you're having to go over a high spot that um, you know then uh, it could affect the coverage behind your behind your tile and um, so again these are all just considerations and um, you know the shape so rectangles are more prevalent than ever and we'll talk about why that you know what difference does it make right square rectangle I mean uh, but there there are some important considerations there um, as we move into a time where the majority of tiles that are on the market are rectangular instead of square um, thin tile gauge porcelain tile um, panels so you know now we've got giant tiles that are 50 square feet and as thin as an eighth of an inch you know or a three millimeter tile um, again, these are huge jumps in, um, in technology that allow us to manufacture these, these products. And there's a lot of it, uh, and there's a lot of advantages to these products. Um, but it does make the installation much more technical, uh, than once upon a time. And then even productivity requirements. So as, uh, as we, you know, as, as all these products change, one thing that never changes is by the time we get to division nine and. When the tile installer comes into the job, it's uh, they're out of two things. They're out of time and they're out of money and it's got to get done. They're already behind schedule. And, you know, um, so they don't have time, you know, to be listening to you talk about, well, you need to take extra days to prep the floor and uh, this, that and the other. And, um, you know, so, again, that's that's always the uh, that's always the problem when you get to this point. And so, um, you know, but again, so having the substrate uh, where it needs to be in advance and understanding that and having planned for that uh, can certainly help with productivity as well. So I mentioned rectangles. You know, what, what difference does it make? Like I said, um, so when we talk about this shape, um, you know, typically with a rectangular tile, we're going to offset these tiles and, um, you know, and, and which, you know, was done previously with, uh, with square tiles on occasion. Um, but there are some things to consider with uh, the way tiles are made uh, when they're pressed and, the, uh, and then fired, <clears throat> you can get a bow um, or warpage and the industry allows for that for a certain amount of warpage and it depends on the size of the tile as far as how much uh, warpage you can actually have. But as these tiles get bigger, uh, you, you have the chance to, to run into larger and larger um, warpage and, and bow in these tiles. And so if you look at that, uh, the visual, so you've got the tiles if you see. So Basically, that's a difference from the middle, um, you know, either being the high or low spot, um, you know, to the edge, uh, to, to the far edge and, and how much that tile actually bows. And so when we talk about offsetting a tile, uh, that's why the industry calls for no more than a 33% offset. So that natural brick pattern of 50-50 offset um, is, is a real challenge for, um, you know, for a tile installer, because on these tiles, if you've got a 16th of an inch bow in this um in this in this tile you know from the middle which is the high spot down to the you know the edge of the tile and then you're running that in a 50 50 split with the tile adjacent to it you know that's so now you're low run, you're, you're lining up the lowest part the the lowest section of your tile to the highest section of the adjacent tile and again this is where you end up with lippage and so um and when we talk about you know, previous considerations as we move on and kind of talk about lippage and the problems and what this brings to the industry. Um, you know, this is the other consideration, right? This is this is not new to the industry. Uh, the uh, the two questions that you needed to answer uh, once upon a time was, can I stick to the substrate, and then can I get all my edges lined up? And again, when you're talking about a smaller format tile, uh, it's uh, it, it's the, the challenge is, is not nearly as great. And the installation is not nearly as technical because it's so much easier to line up all the edges um, and, and and get everything flat. So, and when we talk about lippage again, that's that's basically the difference in height from one tile to an adjacent tile. And you know, and there's a lot of factors that that um, that play into that. But again, I mean, this is the age old this is the age old problem for an installer. I mean, again, you've got two things that you need to do. Um, you know, to get off this job when it comes to setting a tile, and that's making sure it's stuck to the substrate, um, and then uh, that your edges are lined up and that you don't have lippage. And uh, if, if you don't have those, um, you know, get your grout work done. Uh, you know, and that's this whole other presentation right there, but get your grout work done and get off the job and get paid. Um, you know, and, and but unfortunately, that's not as simple of a, of a challenge as it once was. 
So there are a lot of factors that can contribute to lippage. Um, and some of these we can do something about, and some of them we have no control over. Um, so things like the tile thickness, uh, the actual warpage of the tile, like we've talked about, um, the size and the edges. Uh, so these are considerations. I mean, are you are you handed a rectified um, tile? Uh, you know, are, are, and so uh, these again, these are things we can't do anything about. But these these topics in bold are factors that you can control as an installer. And so um, the substrate flatness before you install, the installation methods, um, and then ultimately the, the size of the grout joints. And so, um, you know, there are other things as far as looking at, you know, and trying to, um, you know, when you look at a tile installation and you're looking for imperfections, um, you know, there's some things we can't do. I mean, the, the room you're handed, if it's got a, um, a large western facing window that's going to have light uh, shoot across it, you know, and pick out every little detail, you know, in the late part of the day or, you know, um, there's not a whole lot you can do. Or if you've got a, a glossy tile, again, that uh, tends to, to pick out the imperfections. And um, But again, so we're going to focus on what we can control um, and, and, and ways to overcome that and as we move through the rest of this presentation. So how flat is flat when <clears throat> we're talking about a concrete substrate? And so where we kind of have to start here is, yeah, I mentioned early on, there are, there are differences between what we look at and what we call out in our standards on the tile side back you know, in division nine versus how things are, are judged and measured in division three when you get your concrete poured. And so, uh, floor flatness is the is the scale that um, that is specified and measured um, at at that point in in division three with the con so for the concrete contractor to get off the job and get paid um, this is what he's needing to meet and so we have a, a chart here that kind of gives you an idea of um, a crossover from those those FF numbers and how things are, are measured there by ASTM E 1155. Um, so essentially, the higher the number you'll see, the flatter it gets. All right. And um, now, to be clear, there there is not an official crossover here, right? This is not um, uh, the ACI does not recognize this um, as far as uh, you know. And and so this is not not officially official, but certainly for our for our purpose in our industry, um, this gives you kind of a guideline to understand what you're dealing with. And we have documentation in our industry um, to help you make your point and to communicate this early on. Because again, you know, we're talking about, you know, division three, division three versus, versus division nine. And, you know, as we all know, they're, th these guys are long gone by the time you get to the job. So the, the time to bring this up is not when you're on site and um, getting ready to get start, uh, get started. It's to bring this up early on in the process and make sure you've communicated what, what needs to happen. Um, but as you see there, so when you, you look at an FF of 25, that is roughly that, that quarter inch drop over 10 feet um, that we talk about in our, our industry is the, uh, is the starting point for floor flatness uh, and what we need for smaller format tiles. Um, you know, but then you look to get to the eighth inch, which is the other, um, which is the other measure you hear. So anything that's considered a large format tile that has an edge over 15 inches, you know, we need a flatter floor. And so we'll talk more about that shortly. But again, that, that goes, that's, you're basically doubling the FF number um, to get to that point. And then, and in the tile, in, excuse me, in the uh, concrete industry, that's considered, you know, incredibly flat and is not uh, is well above their normal expectations. And so, um, again, this is just uh, and that's where the disconnect comes. And and so uh, but this is something, again, that we have to understand if we're going to have the conversation and we're going to be able to get what we need as an industry to have a su successful installation, you know, that that is within our industry standards. So a couple other things when we talk about FF numbers. And so with that ASTM 1155, um, the, that is supposed to be measured within the first 72 hours of that slab's life. So, um, you know, when you think about a, a slab that's 72 hours old, I mean, you know, you've only been able to walk on it for 
you know, you know, for you've barely been able to walk on this slab. And so, um, you know, that has a long way to go as far as curing and drying. And so, you know, the standard, you know, standard slab, you're looking at 28 days for curing um, and it's going to continue to dry and, and move beyond that. And so, uh, and slabs curl as they, they, they move as they dry. And um, so what was measured at 72 hours um, can certainly change a great deal. Um, you know, by the time that that slab cures out, and so when you think about the amount of time that passes, um, you know, in large projects between a slab is poured and um, you know, and when a tile installer is on it. Now, I, I understand in, in some in some instances, and in, in, you know, in new construction, you know, residential, um, in some in some markets, I mean, uh, they 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 want the tile guys in there, you know, uh, you know. 10 12 days after a slab is poured but um again this is just something to consider and this is why we don't recommend that you know installing tile um you know unless there's certain precautions and products used over over green concrete um, because of the movement and so again just because something so if you think about if if you've got a floor that was um that was specified as an ff of of 25 uh, then by the time it's dry and by the time you and, and cured and by the time the tile installer gets to the job site, I mean, you, you could be way well out of, um, you know, you could be at a half an inch um, and, and drop over in 10 feet and um, a variation. And, you know, now you're, you, you've got a real challenge on your hands. I mean, that's out for even a small tile. And so um, now you're looking at, at, at a lot of cost and a lot of time uh, to try to repair that. So again, the, the idea being we want to we want to have this com conversation early on in the process and there are resources available to you so that you can help get the um, get the specification changed because and and you're not asking for anything out of the norm I mean what what you what needs to be realized and you have to understand is I mean there's a design professional that that if this is the case um, that has specified for a product to be you know a finished product that needs a certain um, needs a certain quality of uh, flatness and to for a proper installation, but they have not specified that the concrete be finished to that specification, and that again needs to be addressed up front. And so when you're in pre pre construction meetings um, and you get a copy of the plans um, and the specifications, and you can take a look and see what those FF numbers are that are called for in the areas that you're going to be working in. Um, and th that is the time to have this conversation. And so uh, the NTCA, the National Tile Contractors Association reference manual um, goes into this, you know, so it has published floor flatness tolerance of an FF50 and 60 for, for large format tiles, um, you know, and with narrow, uh, narrow grout joints. And so and it also talks, um, it, it talks about how much, um, you know how much these these uh, slabs can move over time, and so with the need to specify beyond, um, you know, so with the anticipation of there being movement, and you know, and an, er an eroding of the uh, of the FF number over time, so that by the time you get there, so if you're going to plan for this up front, you know, let's make sure by the time you get there um, that that you know you still have a reasonable surface to work with that's within tolerances. Um, and it also talks about, you know, certainly, I mean, as far as proper practices for getting that concrete placed, if it's not reinforced, I mean, it, you know, we're talking about a lot more movement possible at that point than, you know, than eroding 10 points. I mean, the, a slab that's not reinforced can move all over the place and be a real problem by the time you get there. Um, so within the, the reference manual, they have, uh, throughout, the, throughout the reference manual, they have several of these um, uh, sample letters for contractors, and these are a great tool um, because, I mean, I know oftentimes it's hard to uh, um, come up with the words, um, you know, make sure you've got, uh, you're citing the right uh, documents and standards and, and things like that. And so, um, you know, this is great. I mean, you know, have something like this, you know, right there, you just put that down, um, you know, insert your information and, and you've got, um, You've got a viable letter to send uh, to the GC and the ownership um, to state your case, and um, you know there are the position statement in there, um, division three versus division nine floor flatness tolerance. Um, so it's uh, again, this is um, 
this is a great a great resource that uh, oftentimes uh, contractors are not aware of and so i would uh, um, if you're not a member of the ntca i mean it's something you should certainly look into uh, take a look at the reference manual um, again this is uh, this is all to help the contractors um, and understanding your rights and uh, and what you need uh, what you need done uh, prior to your arrival so uh, once we move away from you know the ACI and from Division Three, uh, we talk about what does what are our standards within the industry? Uh, what are we looking for? Um, so ANSI A108.02. Um, so this is where we get that. So you, you've heard me talk about this uh, this eighth of an inch and ten feet, and so this is where that comes from. So at least one edge, fifteen inches or longer. So look. It, we talked about it at the very beginning. Tiles, I mean, they're either really small or they're really big. There's not a whole lot of in between. Um, and so, you know, this is this is the standard tile now is a, a considered a large format tile. And so, um, these are the standards you're typically looking for. And, and again, so this is a much more rig, uh, uh, rigorous um, standard to meet than the quarter inch that has tr traditionally been needed uh, for smaller tiles. And so. Um, uh, so this is this is what governs our industry, and this is what we're looking for. This is what you have to achieve um, to be in line with industry standards. So um, if they're not going to do it up front, that means you're responsible for it. And so um, you know, but once you once you take that substrate and start, we're doing work on it. You've accepted it. And so again, these are other conversations that need to be had in advance. And so before you accept that. Uh, substrate and and move forward with your installation you need to have a plan in place you need to uh, they need to understand what needs to be done um, you know what products you're going to use uh, what additional cost there is to get this floor within tolerances and uh, you know and so that that communication needs to be done because again you, you know the, coming back after the fact and saying well you didn't give me um, you didn't give me a slab you know or a substrate that was within tolerances uh, if you've got if you've got lippage or you've got a failure, um, you know that that's you know it's too late at that point. So talking about wood substrates, essentially what you need to think about is it's it's the same. I mean you're still looking um, you're still looking for flatness, and it's that um, you know that sixteenth of an inch and in, in two feet is the real trick on wood uh, because now you're getting into a smaller area, um, but um, with you know, and so instead of talking about an eighth over ten, when you start talking about that sixteenth uh, of an inch and two, um, because you you think about joist spacing, and so uh, it's all falling, you know, hopefully well below uh, two feet. But uh, <clears throat> even if it is at, at twenty four inches or nineteen or sixteen, um, you know, running that straight edge over those small areas, I mean, it's very very easy to get um, you know a variation that exceeds a sixteenth of an inch, and so. Um, this is just something you know you need to be aware of, uh, but you know the, there there is not a lack uh, uh, a lack of a requirement here. There you you still have to meet this. You still need a flat floor uh, if you're going over wood. Um, you know you're seeing a lot of issues there. I mean again, so if they are do have 24 inch joists, I you know it's going to be very difficult to achieve this. Um, you know uh, the products that are being used uh, in construction now. I mean is uh, it, it's getting rarer and rarer to see a, a uh, you know three quarter inch uh, exterior glue plywood. Uh, you know, so you're seeing more and more OSB products on the market. You know, you're not seeing the tongue and groove as often. So again, these are all just challenges. Um, you know, and something you need to be aware of. So walls <clears throat> in this, you know, it's it's the same it's the same conversation um, just on a different plane. And so you know when when all we were sticking on walls were four by four ceramic, it, again, it didn't really matter how flat the wall was. And so you, you've got these, um, you've got these studs that you know maybe out of plumb. You've got you know wider spacing. Um, you, you've got any number of products hung over it, which again are, are is oftentimes done even in, in wet areas. I mean, so it's very it's very typical now. I mean, so obviously the the drywall. Uh, crews come in and they hang the drywall and then if there's a wet area where they're wanting um, cement backer board uh, it's 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 not unusual for them to go ahead and have those guys do do that installation as well and um, you know I, it's very 
it's very typical if you were to stand, you know, and look down a wall. I mean, it looks like uh, it looks like it's moving. And so, <clears throat> you know, if you're trying to stick large format tile, just like on a floor, I mean, you're looking for the same thing. I mean, um, you know, the uh, the GPT, you know, the gauge porcelain tile and panel um, segment is, is huge for walls, and uh, it's a, it's a stunning visual, um, and it's a finish that's that's picking up a lot of steam, but you know, you really need a flat substrate for this. And, you know, 12 by 24, as you're seeing, you know, that seems like a standard now just about for, for wall installations. And so, um, again, these are, um, just because you're on a wall does not uh, does not take away the need for um, substrate prep and, and the same sorts of guidelines. Uh, and then referencing back to the, to the manual, the NTCA reference manual, they do have a white paper in there as well um, that, that can help you out and so again this is just another industry document you can use um to you know to prove your point and um you know and it also talks about how you know and we get back to technology and the way things have changed you know dealing with walls it has been a challenge in the past because you're you're talking about needing to use mud and you know scratch and render coats and it can really slow down the process um so now there's products, um, you know, that have been developed and, you know, particularly uh, for MAPE, we, a couple of years ago, we, we introduced Planet Top 330 Fast, which has been a fantastic product. Essentially, it's a, um, it's a, it's a patch for walls and it, uh, you don't need to do the scratch, um, the, the scratch and render coats, you know, the separate coats. You can go anywhere from an eighth of an inch to an inch and a quarter in a single lift. Um, if you need to do an inch and a quarter, you, you probably need to have another conversation um, other than uh, how to patch your wall. But uh, the, the reality is, I mean, that's what this, this product is designed to do, is to allow you to go in, say, I've got a wall installation, um, you know, I, 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 need to get it, uh, I need to get it within standards. I've identified my low spots just like you would on a floor. Um, you come in, you can fill it in, fill it in, and you just mix it with water. Uh, trowel it on and it dries quickly and you're back to installing within an hour or two and uh, again it's a great product it's fiber reinforced it's very sticky uh, so but you can smooth it down really nice um, and um, but again this just all goes back to um, advances all right we don't we talk about the way things used to be fixed and so you know the idea of um, you know we talked about at the beginning I, I just need to make sure all my my edges. I, can I stick to the floor? You know, can I stick to the substrate? And can I get my edges lined up? And you know, that mentality is is very um, with as the tiles get larger, it is becoming um, very very detrimental to the industry. And so uh, the <clears throat> with the advent of these large and heavy tiles, so now we're talking about a setting bed. So the, the traditional um, thin set uh, style mortars were designed once you know once you you place the tile beat a tile into place um, that it would compress down to no more than three thirty second of an inch and um, so to to exceed that um, you know you it created some problems and so now as we we with the larger tiles and now uh, with large and heavy tile mortars becoming more and more popular um, and accepted across the industry you know these products are designed to to once compressed and underneath the tile to be um, to go all the way up to a half an inch when compressed and so um, you know you you've more than doubled that thickness but um, again the that's a, a half an inch play all right and so within that that setting bed um, so when you have a, a substrate that's all over the place the tendency then is to do this and um, again, sitting at taking an eight by eight and putting a couple globs underneath it to give you the play you need to line everything up wasn't as high of a, a liability. But now you're taking these larger tiles, and you know this is what you'll see. Um, you know, there's they've taken the time to comb all that mortar, but that wasn't enough. They they didn't have enough uh, bed there to overcome the substrate um, deficiencies, so they put a bunch of globs underneath it. I mean, that mortar that they that they've combed there is serving no purpose. Um, and you know it, the only thing that's contacting the tile are those globs. Um, you know they they did go the extra mile here. Um, oftentimes you'll just see five of them. Uh, they put an extra four globs in there. So there is that. But again, you have so much tile that's unsupported. Um, that's how you get cracked tiles, tiles that pop. Once you know if everything starts moving, 
And, and this is not how we fix tile. I mean, this is not the appropriate way to prep a substrate. So bringing up large and heavy tile mortar, so this is a relatively new term. Um, you know, the term medium bed has, has been around the industry for a while, um, you know, and it's certainly taken on new meaning over the years. Um, and just to, if you, if you look in the TCNA handbook and the mortar selection guide, um, it, it talks about this. And um, so just to be clear, and, you know, and this is important, so LHT mortar is not intended for the truing or leveling of substrates or the work of others. Um, where substrate variation exceeds allowances, LHT mortar cannot be used to remedy such because the application would exceed the limitations of the mortar. LHT mortar is intended to be used to install tile for per ANSI A108.5, the installation standard for installing tile by thin bed method. So we're still in a, a thin a thin bed uh, installation method here. We are uh, there is not a a medium bed um, installation method, and so that's what's important to remember here. That, that we're talking about a product, not a method, and so. And nothing has changed just because you're using this mortar as far as what the requirements are uh, for getting your your substrate um, up to up up to standard. And so uh, this picture on the right is from a project um, that I was at multiple times, uh, and it was a, a gauge porcelain installation um, exterior. And <clears throat> the you can see um, what happened was is. The the original the original challenge they faced was you had a block wall had a pool above it there this this wall goes up about 20 25 feet um, and they had put a, a fluid applied air barrier and it wasn't suitable for um, for direct bond so uh, the GC decided to hire somebody other than the tile contractor to um, to to hang lath and to do a, a, a brown coat, a scratch coat, whatever you want to call it. Um, so the tile contractor shows up, and there's a uh, there's there's a brown coat wall there, and I apparently he assumed that uh, they had taken the time to uh, uh, when applying that to make sure everything was good and flat, and so they just went in and and skimmed over the top of the um, uh, over the top of the scratch and smoothed it out. Um, but again, nobody took time to notice uh, how flat was the substrate. So, it's, and they watched the videos and felt comfortable that they understood um, what needed to be done as far as combing mortar on the substrate and on the back of the tile and in the same direction. And, um, but realized as they tried to, to place the tiles that there was not they didn't have enough play again they the the they could not line up these edges because the substrate was 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 so far out of, it was so far out of flat and they so the solution there then is to they globbed um they globbed mortar around the edges uh threw some globs within the field of the tile and stuck it up there and that gave them the play they needed but then the challenge was is now essentially you have um you've created you know these five foot by ten foot tiles that now have all this space underneath them, um, and the I mentioned there was a pool deck up above, and you know the, they had messed up the coping there, and it was dumping water uh, down into the installation, and it was essentially pooling back behind these tiles, and it would get stuck in there, and uh, then they would get heated up, and then you see over on the right, you know these were uh, a a shiny black porcelain tile that then started spouting out um, a combination of efflorescence as well as latex. And, um, you know, so, cause again, that water would heat up behind, uh, it would start to evaporate, basically like bubbling out of the seams and out of the grout joints uh, that, it, and that had been caulked and it blew the caulk out and you had a huge mess. And so not only could they, uh, that it looked bad, but it was also a nightmare to clean because they had to use two different cleaners. They had to use an acidic cleaner for the efflorescence and an alkali cleaner for the latex. And um, it was just, a, it was a big mess. And at the end of the day, uh, they actually got a, a hard freeze in that area. Um, it was in the Houston area, which is unusual, but um, that, that pool of water behind expanded and blew a tile off the wall. Um, and so, Again, this is an extreme example, but it's also just, a, a, and I, I, I talk about this to drive home the point of how important it is 
that you know if, if somebody would have just understood from the get-go I mean they went through the trouble of, of putting up you know an entire an entire brown coat that was then skimmed over I mean that the the opportunity was there the work was done it should have been a flat substrate but it didn't get done there was no understanding of what was needed and so then you end up back at the old well we'll just glop some mortar on there and fix it that way and that the, again these these are just different installations and that's not going to work oh and to the point um there's the additional note in there for the specifier uh, it is a product not an installation method so if you have a plan that is calling for uh, you know a medium bed method or a large and heavy method just understand that is not correct and there is language um, in our industry that can help get that corrected all right so I told you not how not to fix it so let's talk about how do you fix it how do we if we need to get a floor flattened out um, if we need to get this thing ready for a large format tile installation how are we going to do that so there are um, there are several different ways the industry treats this uh, mud bed um, so mud installations um, when if and when substrate prep has been done in the past it was with mud in the tile industry a grind and patch again um, this is a little bit different for tile um, but uh, uh, certainly a viable option and then uh, self levelers and so the you know the idea of self levelers in the tile industry, I mean, you would have gotten laughed out of the room um, not too long ago, but you know, with these tiles getting larger and larger, um, as the understanding of these have become greater and greater within the industry about how easy they are to, to work with and how quickly they work, and, and then ultimately, you know, what you get for so little effort um, as far as a finished product is just, it's a dream come true to a tile installer who's so used to having to fight with every tile you know, over a bad substrate to get everything lined up, you know, now you're just able to, 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 you know, do your layout, your tiles are laying on a flat substrate, and it's so easy to spread your mortar, um, set, and move on, and you're not fighting with each and every tile trying to get it, uh, <clears throat> trying to get it where it, where it needs to go. So, as far as mud mixes, I, I mentioned Planet Top 330 Fast earlier, again, that's a, it's, that one's for walls, and you can use it on floors, too, um, you know, in certain applications. You know the four to one that's your standard mud mix you know four parts sand to one part cement and so you know the 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 traditional mud mix and then still to this day you see it done on site um you know four or five i think industry the ANSI calls five to one uh sand to cement and so you know there are guys that that, that love their 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 on-site mix and then if they're going on a wall they'll they'll throw the lime in there um and and uh, and that's great. And so these are all acceptable. But again, this, uh, you know, we talk about technology and new products, you know, sand and cement, you know, is not real highly, uh, is not, is not real, real, really advanced technology, right? I mean, it's just Portland cement and sand. And so as far as drying times, things like that, that's always the big question with mud, mud mix. And so, um, you know, in the name of the game being get, get on site, get it done and get off as quickly as you can. Uh, we've developed other products. Um, our Planet Slope RS is a uh, rapid setting modified mortar bed. And so uh, it's a relatively new product for us, but it's been great so far. And so this gives you the, the ability, um, you know, on fast track projects, you know, you can use it on floors and walls um, to, to be able to, um, uh, to waterproof or install tile in a hurry. And so uh, modified mortar bed, is basically exactly what it says it is. Uh, it is a uh, mud bed that, that has latex added. So when you talk about, uh, you know, with four to one, if you're doing exterior applications, we, we have you mix uh, a liquid uh, liquid latex add mixture to it. Uh, whereas this, you know, you can use it on floors and walls of exterior, um, you know, with the scratch and render um, method. And it's, uh, again, so it's just the, as, 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 as technology is advanced, so of the muds that are available to you. So when we talked about patching and skim coating, um, you know, so grinding, you know, I I came from the Texas market, and um, you know, I, this is a, um, you know, and and my background uh, oftentimes was outside of tile and other forms of uh, of insulation like wood and um, you know and soft goods, and and so uh, patching is is 
has long been um, understood on that side of the business um, as a way to you know fill in those minor imperfections. I mean, these are um, these are topics that have been accepted over there um, on that you know on on the soft side of the industry that uh, I need a flat subfloor, and so <clears throat> that's where we're trying to get um, on 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 the tile side is to to get everybody on the same page there, but. What this does is this does give you a chance is if you can identify just those specific low spots, I mean, you can get in and fill those in quickly. These products dry quickly. Uh, you just hand trowel it in, um, you know, and then you're on your way. Um, these two products themselves are, are um, exterior rated, so they're not affected by moisture. And that's a good thing in the tile industry because most tile installers are not checking uh, for sub substrate moisture. Um, we have a number of, of patching um, options but um and and when we talk about grinding so that's another important thing to, to 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 discuss is you know i've been on job sites for you know brand new houses where the uh, installers are off you know to supposed to install a plank tile or they're supposed to install wood and uh they're calling for you know they're using 15 20 bags of, of floor patch on a brand new slab and the builders are wanting answers and um, you know, and part of the problem is, is the, the garbage substrate they've handed over to the, to the installer. But also there's the idea of, you know, if you, if you've got two high spots in, in a living room that you're doing, you know, a couple hundred square feet, um, you're probably better off, you know, identifying those high spots and grinding them down as opposed to then trying to bring up the rest of the room. Um, you know, and so again, uh, that's just another method because uh, at the end of the day, we're, we're all looking for the same thing. We're just looking for a flat floor with intolerances. And so these are these are options for you as well. And then self-leveling underlayments, uh, we make a bunch and they all have kind of their little niches in the market. Um, you know, uh, the uh, the idea here being that you, you're you not on your hands and knees. Um, you know, you've got an area that you need to make sure it's flat. And so all you're doing here is, is making sure you prep that floor and it's clean um, you know, you've got it primed and, uh, and then you pour this and you can cover a large area in a short period of time. And they're, they're very technologically advanced to dry quickly, uh, to dry flat. And, um, you know, so you can turn around and as little as a couple of hours be installing tile. And so again, this is something that was not really a, uh, a consideration not that long ago within the tile industry. Um, but it's really grabbing hold now. I mean, guys, I mean, their life, like I said, is so much easier um, when you get to the point where all you have to do is, is, is pour this out, you know, and then by the time you're back from lunch, you're <clears throat> snapping a line and, and, and setting tile. So if you're, back to the original question uh, that's always been asked, can I bond to this substrate? So can I stick to it? And this is where a floor prep um, as far as, um, you know, what do we need to do to be successful as far as bonding to the substrate? Um, you know, so any prep work you're going to do, uh, any of our products you're going to apply to the substrate, or I mean, even if you're just going to say, all right, I think it's good enough as is, um, it's flat enough, I'm going to uh, just go ahead and uh, start spreading mortar. Uh, it's got to be clean, all right? So we can't have bond breakers on the, on, and there's any number, right, on a job site. Uh, so even new construction, by the time we get in there, uh, there's usually joint compound everywhere, there's drywall dust everywhere, um, there could be paint everywhere. I mean, there's any number of things um, that are on the substrate. And, you know, so you're only as good as what you bond to. And so we've got to remove contaminants from the substrate. So there are multiple ways to do that. Um, mechanical is how we recommend. And so mechanical means a lot of different things. It, it, it means, um, it, but so we don't want you to acid etch, all right? So that means that's chemical. So that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for mechanical ways to remove contaminants. So right here, you're looking at grinders, um, which are, are common. And, you know, certainly the diamond cup grinders, handheld um, in the tile industry uh, to help knock loose, uh, open up that concrete and give you a chance to, to, to bond. So this is a shot blaster. So I, Again, this is not your everyday tile guy is going to have a uh, going to be blast a floor, but this is a really good example uh, of what uh, of what you can achieve um, by prepping these floors mechanically. Sorry about that.
Um, so if you look on the right, you can see where the uh, where the floor has been prepped and um, you can see where the floor has been prepped and it has um, and you see how light it is in color it compared to the to the left side of the screen uh, where there's all sorts of contaminants and any number of things um, you know and so the the shot blasters you know they they shoot was essentially the uh, shotgun shot, you know, steel beads onto the floor and a high powered vac and uh, a magnet system uh, evacuates the dust and recaptures the beads as you move along and it pulverizes the surface. So you have a nice, clean, porous substrate, which in our world as a manufacturer, this, uh, this makes you very happy. And this is a really great place to be for us to bond and to really feel comfortable. And so, again, this is not every project, but when you when you wonder why we go there, I mean, why this recommendation is often made, uh, this is just a, a really good visual example. When we talk about profile, um, you know, so grinding, you know, we started at grinding, and, and grinding grinding is very useful in the um, um, in the tile industry, and so this is a a a, a prep method that's been accepted for a long time. Um, so again, you've got you've got those grind, grinder blades moving in a circular motion um, and uh, opening up the concrete surface. Now the challenge there is making sure because as you're as you're tearing uh, tearing open that surface, you're also kind of forcing uh, a lot of that um, back down into the substrate. So you need to make sure you do a good job of vacuuming, uh, you know, vacuuming that area and removing that dust that you're creating and contaminants you're creating while you do it. But um, you get a circular cut, and uh, generally, like I said, you get good porosity after that and a good surface to bond to. Shot blasting is a little more aggressive, and we've talked about that. Scarifying, you know, that's pretty specialized and probably not something you're going to see a lot of in the tile industry, um, but certainly that that is the sort of profile you're looking at. And so for, uh, for a lot of toppings and, um, you know, more uh, high-end commercial type uh, you know, or uh, parking garages, things like that. That's what they're looking for. Um, when we talk about profiles, concrete surface profiles, there are the chipsets that are out on the market um, created by the International Concrete Repair Institute. Um, you, anybody can order these. Um, but that's again, it's a rubber chipset that basically has each of these profiles, so you can you can actually feel it and see it and um, take it on site and, and compare it. So anything, everything from a one to a 10. Now the one to three, that's really where we live in the, in the flooring industry um, for the most part. And so, you know, uh, whereas uh, grinding is going to get you into that uh, CSP of two range, um, shot blasting is going to get you into that three um, and, and higher if you do a heavy shot blast. But again, those uh, that when so if you do hear that term CSP, the concrete surface profile, that's what we're, that's what we're referencing. All right, so as we kind of move out of substrate conditions, we're gonna talk a little bit about job site conditions. Um, so this is, and, and this goes back, I think, you know, like, like I mentioned at the beginning, the versatility of tile um, has kind of created um, some issues for us the, in this idea that you can just, well, I mean, look, just go stick the tile. I mean, what, do you, what do you need from me? Um, but there are limits. And so you've got to have, um, for these products that you're using, you have to have certain conditions um, to to give them a chance to succeed and and certainly as you approach the edges of these um, um, uh, of these allowances you know it's going you know there's no real magic line between 45 and 44 degrees you know or 95 and 96 so you gotta understand as you get um, as you get to the uh, to the limits of, of these products you know you you're gonna see different you're gonna see varying performances and, and different challenges and so that's kind of the idea here is to Let's talk about some of the conditions we're handed and what we can do, um, and, and some different considerations. And so, um, but yeah, I mean, there's always um, there's always minimum and maximums for products. You're always going to see that on the data sheet, and it's very important that you you um, you know understand the projects you're you're handed. Um, when is that project? You know, uh, what time of year is it? I mean, what are the conditions? If it's not, you know, if you're working out of town. Um, you know, do some research as to what conditions are like when you're expected to be there, and so you can plan accordingly. 
Um, things like direct sunlight, um, even on an interior installation can cause a lot of problems, you know, certainly wind, rain. So how do we protect from that? Um, you know, maintaining um, conditions so that we don't see drastic differences from the beginning of an installation to the end of an installation, um, and then protecting it afterwards uh, to make sure things uh, dry out, cure correctly. So why do we need to protect our work? I mean, look, things, things go wrong on job sites, all right? Uh, conditions can become very, very difficult very quickly, um, and it just creates real havoc with, with you know, what, what you're trying to do and, and how to do it correctly. And so it creates delays uh, and any number of issues. So yeah, tile, hey, like I said, we're good, right? We're ready for tile. You know, you need a boat to get over to the, uh, over to the building because uh, the job site's flooded. Uh, there's uh, every piece of trash from, you know, the first three months of construction is piled up in your, uh, in your work area that you're supposed to start setting tile on. Um, you know, I, I was looking for a picture to do justice. I've, I've been to so many job sites over the years, um, you know, where your tile guys are stuck back in a, you know, an interior bathroom and, you know, uh, and they're having to work under, you know, their own provided light and, um, you know, there's no air movement. There's no, there's no, um, there's no climate control. So you're completely at the mercy of the conditions. And so, um, you know, when they're trying to drop in a, you know, a, in a shower, put in a mud bed that needs to be waterproofed and, you know, and it's just a standard, you know, mud mix. And the question is, well, I mean, you know, when, when is this going to be a dry enough to put a, um, to, to put a waterproofing membrane over? And, you know, and that's a really good question because, you know, if you've got damp, cool conditions and all you've got is sand and cement mixed with water um, and you've got no air movement, it, it's going to take a long time for that to be dry enough to put um, to put that membrane over. So again, you know, these are the sorts of conditions that you have to to anticipate. Um, you know, and uh, and just because somebody else made that mess, I mean, you know, unless you can talk somebody else into cleaning it up, I mean, you've got to make sure all that junk is off the floor, and you've cleaned that floor, and you've got a good substrate to bond to. And so, um, but we're 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 not naive to this. We know we've been on enough job sites. We know how difficult it is for you guys and what, you know, what type of conditions you're often handed. So proper tenting, tarping. So again, if you're working in situations where um, you're needing to be able to control the environment, you've got to take the steps to do it. And um, <clears throat> a lot of this is about anticipation and understanding where you're working and, um, and when um, and what those types of conditions uh, can and might be, um, you know, but, because uh, again, anything from as simple as a sunspot, you know, a really sunny area as you're working versus areas, you know, adjacent to it that are not, I mean, it's, you're going to see a big difference in performance of products. Um, you know, you can, you can, uh, your mortars can skin over, um, you know, you get differential in drying. And, and so, um, again, it's just taking the proper precautions. And these are just good examples of, of how that's been done. So a proper hoarding. So when, and this was a term I honestly never heard used in this capacity um, until I got into this industry. But um, this apparently was a pool installation up in, uh, I believe it was in Banff, uh, in Canada, near Calgary. And so um, they uh, wanted to tile the pool at a hotel, and it was winter time because I mean, again, we don't want to install in top. We don't, we don't want to do the pool in the summertime, right? Because we need uh, we need people in that pool. Um, so again, I mean, is this extreme? Sure, sure it is. But there's often times where, you know, that's what we're called to do in the industry is um, go out and install tile in a pool, you know, up in the mountains in Canada um, and during the winter. And so you've got to take proper precautions. Um, you know, if, if you want to have a successful installation, you know, this needs to be planned for um, cost-wise. I mean, yeah, this probably cost a lot of money to, to, to build all this, but it's what's necessary uh, to be able to control that site so that you can have a successful installation. Because outside, you probably got something like this going on, and if that gets inside, there's no way you're gonna be able to finish this install. But if you do it correctly, um, you know, you can have, a, you, you can have success, um, you know, and, and again, a lot of this just goes back to, to proper planning and understanding the, the, the project you have, uh, the conditions you can expect when you when you get on site um, and you know so uh, 
again, uh, a bit to the extreme, not every project is gonna take that. It could be as simple as a tarp, you know, just putting something up so that, you know, we're putting paper in a window, um, you know, that, that has a bright sun coming through it, that's heating up a part of the room, you know, uh, just something to help control your conditions and, and be prepared to do that so that you can be successful in your installation. And with that, I am finished. So um, we will move on. Uh, All right. Jen. Yeah. Can you hear me? I can. All right. Fantastic. Thank you. We do have some questions. Uh, the first is, is there a limitation based on humidity in the air? Um. No, I, I'm not familiar with any limitations based specifically off of humidity. Um, you know, uh, the now you, you certainly, I mean, it's going to affect uh, the way products dry. Um, you know, and these are all just considerations. So, I mean, if you're um, if you're installing in in Arizona, um, you know, in the summertime, again, you, you <clears throat> you've got what maybe 10% humidity at the highest, if even that, and you know, hot, dry air, you know, blowing across, you know, these are all just considerations. So now you're going to, you're going to be looking at extreme drying conditions on, on that end versus, you know, installing, you know, I, if, if there were limitations on the high end, uh, you'd never get anything installed down here in, in South Florida. But, uh, but they certainly are, are considerations because the, when, when you talk about a product that you've added water to and that, and that moisture needs to evacuate, uh, the bigger the differential in the, in the surrounding atmosphere uh, and the substrate is going to play big into how quickly it dries. So if you've got wet, um, you know, damp substrate and damp air around it, it's going to slow things down, certainly versus a dry substrate uh, that will pull moisture out of it, as well as dry air around it that will do the same. Fantastic. Um, the other question has to do with the recording of the webinar. And yes, this has been recorded and we will make the uh, recording available. It will actually be on our website and uh, you can download it there. Thank you, Logan. And thank you for joining us. This concludes today's webinar. We'll see you next week. Have a great rest of your day.